Book One, Chapter Three, Part Four of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee. Book One, Chapter Three, The Jews and the Conversos, Part Four. The most prominent among the new conversos was Salimo Ha Levi, a rabbi who had been the most intrepid defender of the faith and rights of his race. On the eve of the massacres, which perhaps he foresaw and influenced by an opportune vision of the Virgin in 1390, he professed conversion, taking the name of Pablo de Santa Maria and was followed by his two brothers and five sons, founding a family of commanding influence. After a course in the University of Paris he entered the church, rising to the see of Cartagena, and then to that of Burgos, which he transmitted to his son Alfonso. At the Cortes of Toledo, in 1406, he so impressed Henry the Third that he was appointed tutor and governor of the Infante Juan the Second mayor of castile and a member of the royal council when in the course of the same year the king died he named pablo among those who were to have the conduct and education of juan during his minority when the regent fernando of antequera left castile to assume the crown of aragon he appointed pablo to replace him and the pope honored him with the position of legate a la terre in 1432, in his 81st year, he wrote his Scrutinium Scriptuarum against his former co-religionists. It is more moderate than is customary in these controversial writings, and seems to have been composed rather as a justification of his own course. Another prominent converso was the rabbi Yehoshua A. Lorki, who took the name of Jeronimo de Santa Fe, and founded a family almost as powerful as the Santa Marias. He, too, showed his zeal in the book named Hebreo Mastix, in which he exaggerated the errors of the Jews in the manner best adapted to excite the execration of Christians. Another leading converso family was that of the Caballerias, of which eight brothers were baptized, and one of them, Bonafos, who called himself Miser Pedro de la Caballeria, wrote in 1464 the celo de cristo contra los judíos in which he treated them with customary obloquy as the synagogue of satan and argues that the hope of christianity lies in their ruin in thus stimulating the spirit of persecuting fanaticism we shall see how these men sowed the wind and reaped the whirlwind Meanwhile, the position of the Jews grew constantly more deplorable. Decimated and impoverished, they were met by a steadily increasing temper of hatred and oppression. The massacres of 1391 had been followed by a constant stream of emigration to Granada and Portugal, which threatened to complete the depopulation of the Alhamas, and, with the view of arresting this, Henry III, in 1395, promised them the royal protection for the future. The worth of that promise was seen in 1406, when in Cordova the remnant of the Juderia was again assailed by the mob, hundreds of Jews were slain, and their houses were sacked and burnt. It is true that the king ordered the magistrates to punish the guilty, and expressed his displeasure by a fine of 24,000 doblas on the city, but he had, the year before, in the Cortes of 1405, assented to a series of laws depriving the Jews at once of property and of defense by declaring void all bonds of Christians held by them, reducing to one-half all debts due them, and requiring a Christian witness and a debtor's acknowledgment for the other half, annulling their privileges in the trial of mixed cases, and requiring the hateful red circle to be worn except in traveling when it could be laid aside in view of the murders which it invited 
This was cruel enough, yet it was but a foretaste of what was in store. In 1410, when the Queen Regent Doña Catalina was in Segovia, there was revealed a sacrilegious attempt by some Jews to maltreat a consecrated host. The story was that the sacristan of San Fagun had pledged it as security for a loan. The street in which the bargain was made acquiring in consequence the name of Calle de Mal Consejo. The Jews cast it repeatedly into a boiling cauldron, when it persistently arose and remained suspended in the air, a miracle which so impressed some of them that they were converted and carried the form to the Dominican convent and related the facts. The wafer was piously administered in communion to a child who died in three days. Doña Catalina instituted a vigorous investigation, which implicated Don Mayer, one of the most prominent Jews in the kingdom, whose services as physician had prolonged the life of the late king. He was subjected to torture sufficient to elicit not only his participation in the sacrilege, but also that he had poisoned his royal master. The convicts were drawn through the streets and quartered, as were also some others who in revenge had attempted to poison Juan de Tordesillas, the bishop of Segovia. The Jewish synagogue was converted into the church of Corpus Christi, and an annual procession still commemorates the event. San Vicente Ferrer turned it to good account, for we are told that in 1411 he almost destroyed the remnants of Judaism in the bishopric. The affair made an immense impression, especially, it would seem, on San Vicente, convincing him of the advisability of forcing the Jews into the bosom of the church by reducing them to despair. At Ayon, in 1411, he represented to the regents the necessity of further repressive legislation, and his eloquence was convincing. The Ordenamiento de Doña Catalina, promulgated in 1412, and drawn up by Pablo de Santa Maria as Chancellor of Castile, was the result. By this rigorous measure, Jews and Moors, under savage and ruinous penalties, were not only required to wear the distinguishing badges, but to dress in coarse stuffs, and not to shave or to cut the hair round. They could not change their abodes, and any nobleman or gentleman receiving them on his lands was heavily fined and obliged to return them whence they came, while expatriation was forbidden under pain of slavery. Not only were the higher employments of farming the revenues, tax collecting, and practicing as physicians and surgeons forbidden, but any position in the households of the great and numerous trades, such as those of apothecaries, grocers, farriers, blacksmiths, peddlers, carpenters, tailors, barbers, and butchers. They could not carry arms or hire Christians to work in their houses or on their lands. That they should be forbidden to eat, drink, or bathe with Christians, or be with them in feasts and weddings, or serve as godparents, was a matter of course under the canon law. But now even private conversation between the races was prohibited. Nor could they sell provisions to Christians, or keep a shop or ordinary for them. It is perhaps significant that nothing was said about usury. Money lending was almost the only occupation remaining open, while the events of the last twenty years had left little capital wherewith to carry it on, and the laws of 1405 had destroyed all sense of security in making loans. They were moreover deprived of the guarantees so long enjoyed, and were subjected to the exclusive jurisdiction, civil and criminal, of the Christians. They were thus debarred from the use of their skill and experience in the higher pursuits, professional and industrial, and were condemned to the lowest and rudest forms of labor. In fine, a wall was built around them from which their only escape was through the baptismal font. Fernando of Antequera carried the law in all its essentials to Aragon, and King Duarte adopted it in Portugal so that it ruled the whole peninsula except the little kingdom of Navarre, where Judaism was already almost extinct. It is significant that Fernando, in promulgating it in Majorca, 
alleged in justification the complaints of the inquisitors as to the social intercourse between jews and christians while san vicente and pablo de santa maria were thus engaged in reducing to despair the jews of castile the other great converso jeronimo de santa fe was laboring in a more legitimate way for their conversion in aragon he had been appointed physician to the avignonese pope benedict the thirteenth who had been obliged to cross the pyrenees and who on november twenty fifth fourteen twelve summoned the aljamas of aragon to send in the following january their most learned rabbis to san mateo near tortosa for a disputation with jeronimo on the proposition that the messiah had come fourteen rabbis selected from the synagogues of all spain with fidal ben veniste at their head accepted the challenge the debate opened february seventh fourteen fourteen under the presidency of benedict himself who warned them that the truth of christianity was not to be discussed but only sixteen propositions put forward by jeronimo thus placing them wholly on the defensive despite this disadvantage they held their ground tenaciously during seventy-nine sessions prolonged through a term of twenty-one months jeronimo covered himself with glory by his unrivalled dialectical subtlety and exhaustless stores of learning and his triumph was shown by his producing a division between his opponents during this colloquy in the summer of fourteen thirteen some two hundred jews of the synagogues of saragossa calatayud and alcanis professed conversion in fourteen fourteen there was a still more abundant harvest a hundred and twenty families of catalayud daroca fraga and barbastro presented themselves for baptism and these were followed by the whole aljamas of alcanis caspe maella lerida tamarit and alcolea amounting to about thirty five hundred souls the repressive legislation was accomplishing its object and hopes were entertained that with the aid of the inspired teaching of san vicente judaism would become extinct throughout spain to stimulate the movement by an increase of severity towards the recalcitrant benedict issued his constitution etsi doctoribus gentium in which he virtually embodied the ordenamiento de doña catalina thus giving to its system of terrible repression the sanction of church as well as of state he further forbade the possession of the talmud or of any books contrary to the christian faith ordering the bishops and inquisitors to make semi-annual inquests of the aljamas and to proceed against all found in possession of such books no jew should even bind a book in which the name of christ or the virgin appeared princes were exhorted to grant them no favors or privileges and the faithful at large were commanded not to rent or sell houses to them or to hold companionship or conversation with them moreover they were prohibited to exercise usury and thrice a year they were to be preached to and warned to abandon their errors the bishops in general were ordered to see to the strict enforcement of all these provisions and the execution of the bull was specially confided to gonzalo bishop of siguenza son of the great converso pablo de santa maria as the utterance of the anti-pope benedict this searching and cruel legislation designed to reduce the jews to the lowest depths of poverty and despair was current only in the lands of his obedience but when his triumphant rival martin v confirmed the charge confided to the bishop of siguenza he accepted and ratified the act of benedict nay more in 1434 alfonso de santa maria bishop of burgos another son of the converso pablo when a delegate to the council of basle procured the passage of a decree in the same sense the quarrel of the council with the papacy it is true deprived its utterance of ecumenic authority but this deficiency was supplied when in fourteen forty two 
Eugenius the Fourth issued a bull which was virtually a repetition of the law of Doña Catalina and of the constitution of Benedict the Thirteenth, while this was followed in 1447 by an even more rigorous one of Nicholas the Fifth. Thus all factions of the Church, however much they might wrangle on other points, cheerfully united in rendering the life of the Jew as miserable as possible, and in forbidding princes to show him favor. This was symbolized when, in 1418, the legate of Martin V was solemnly received in Gerona, and the populace, with inerring instinct, celebrated the closing of the great schism and the reunion of the church by playfully sacking the Juderia, though the royal officials, blind to the piety of the demonstration, severely punished the perpetrators. The immediate effect of this policy corresponded to the intentions of its authors, though its ultimate results can scarce have been foreseen. The Jews were humiliated and impoverished. Despite their losses by massacre and conversion, they still formed an important portion of the population, with training and aptitudes to render service to the state. But, debarred from the pursuits for which they had been fitted, they were crippled both for their own recuperation and for the benefit of the public. The economic effect was intensified by the inclusion of the mudejares in the repressive legislation. Commerce and manufactures decayed, and many products which Spain had hitherto exported she was now obliged to import at advanced prices. On the other hand, the conversos saw open to them a career fitted to stimulate and satisfy ambition. Confident in their powers, with intellectual training superior to that of the Christians, they aspired to the highest places in the courts, in the universities, in the church, and in the state. Wealth and power rendered them eligible suitors, and they entered into matrimonial alliances with the noblest houses in the land, many of which had been impoverished by the shrinkage of the revenues derived from their Jewish subjects. Alfonso de Santa Maria, in procuring the decree of Basle, was careful to insert in it a recommendation of marriage between converts and Christians as the surest means of preserving the purity of the faith and the advice was extensively followed. Thus the time soon came when there were few of the ancient nobility of Spain who were not connected closely or remotely with the Jew. We hear of marriages with Lunas, Mendozas, Villa Hermosas, and others of the proudest houses. As early as 1449 a petition to Lope de Barrientes, Bishop of Cuenca, by the Conversos of Toledo, enumerates all the noblest families of Spain as being of Jewish blood, and among them the Enriques, from whom the future Ferdinand the Catholic descended through his mother, Juana Enriques. It was the same in the church, where we have seen the rank attained by the Santa Marias. Juan de Torquemada, Cardinal of San Sisto, was of Jewish descent, and so, of course, was his nephew, the first Inquisitor General as was likewise Diego Deza, the second inquisitor-general, as well as Hernando de Talavera, archbishop of Granada. It would be easy to multiply examples, for in every career the vigor and keenness of the Jews made them conspicuous, and in embracing Christianity they seemed to be opening a new avenue for the development of the race in which it would become dominant over the old Christians. In fact, an Italian nearly contemporary describes them as virtually ruling Spain, while secretly perverting the faith by their covert adherence to Judaism. This triumph, however, was short-lived. Their success showed that thus far there had been no antagonism of race, but only of religion. This speedily changed. The hatred and contempt which, as apostates, they lavished on the faithful sons of Israel reacted on themselves. It was impossible to stimulate popular abhorrence of the Jew without at the same time stimulating the envy and jealousy excited by the ostentation and arrogance of the new Christians. What was the use of humiliating and exterminating the Jew 
if these upstarts were not only to take his place in grinding the people as tax-gatherers but were to bear rule in court and camp and church meanwhile the remnant of the jews were slowly but indomitably recovering their position it was much easier to enact the ordenamiento de doña catalina than to enforce it and like much previous legislation it was growing obsolete in many respects in the early days of juan the second abraham benaviste was virtually finance minister and when the infante henry of aragon seized the king at tordesillas and carried him off he justified the act by saying that it was because the government was in the hands of abraham in fact there are indications of a reaction in which the jews were used as a counterpoise to the menacing growth of converso influence when in fourteen forty two the cruel bull of eugenius the fourth was received although it scarce contained more than the laws of fourteen twelve and the bull of benedict the thirteenth alvaro de luna the all-powerful favorite not only refused to obey it but proceeded to give legal sanction to the neglect into which those statutes had fallen he induced his master to issue the pragmatico of arevalo april sixth fourteen forty three condemning the refusal of many persons to buy or sell with jews and moors or to labor for them in the fields under color of a bull of eugenius the fourth published at toledo during his absence punishment is threatened for those audacities for the bull and the laws provide that jews and moors and christians shall dwell together in harmony and no one is to injure or slay them it was not intended to prevent jews and moors and christians from dealing together nor that the former should not follow industries base and servile such as all manner of mechanical trades and christians can serve them for proper wages and guard their flocks and labor for them in the fields and they can prescribe for christians if the medicines are compounded by christians thus a revulsion had taken place in favor of the prescribed race which threatened to undo the work of vicente ferrer and the conversos it was in vain that in fourteen fifty one nicholas v issued another bull repeating and confirming that of eugenius the fourth it received no attention and under the protection of alvaro de luna the jews made good use of the breathing space to reconstruct their shattered industries and to demonstrate their utility to the state the conspiracy which sent alvaro to the block in fourteen fifty three was a severe blow but on the ascension of henry the fourth in fourteen fifty four they secured the goodwill of his favorites and even procured the restoration of some old privileges the most important of which was the permission to have their own judges one element in this was the influence enjoyed by the royal physician jacob aben nunez on whom was conferred the office of rob mayor in the virtual anarchy of the period however when every noble was a law unto himself it is impossible to say how far royal decrees were effective or to postulate any general conditions in fourteen fifty eight the constable velasco orders his vassals of the town of aro to observe the law forbidding christians to labor for jews and moors but he makes the wise exception that they may do so when they can find no other work wherewith to support themselves even under these conditions the superior energy of the non-christian races was rapidly acquiring for them the most productive lands if we may trust a decree of the town of aro in fourteen fifty three forbidding christians to sell their estates to moors and jews for if this were not stopped the christians would have no ground to cultivate as the moors already held all the best of the irrigated lands the nobles had seen the disadvantage of the sternly oppressive laws and disregarded them to their own great benefit thus raising the envy of the districts obliged to observe them for the cortes of fourteen sixty two petitioned henry to restore liberty of trade between christian and jew alleging the inconvenience caused by the restriction and the depopulation of the crown lands for as trade was permitted in the lands of the nobles the jews were concentrating there 
when, further, the Cortes asked that Jews should be permitted to return with their property and trades to the cities in the royal domains from which they had been expelled, it indicates that popular adversion was becoming directed to the conversos rather than to the Jews. It may be questioned whether it was to preserve the advantage here indicated, or to gain popular favor, that the revolted nobles, in 1460, demanded of Henry that he should banish from his kingdoms all Moors and Jews who contaminated religion and corrupted morals, and that, when they deposed him in 1465 at Avila, and elevated to the throne the child Alfonso, the Concordia Compromissoria, which they dictated, annulled the Pragmatica of Arevalo, and restored to vigor the laws of 1412 and the bull of Benedict the Thirteenth. This frightened the Jews, who offered to Henry an immense sum for Gibraltar, where they proposed to establish a city of refuge, but he refused. The fright was superfluous, for, in the turbulence of the time, the repressive legislation was speedily becoming obsolete. When the reforming Council of Aranda, in 1473, made but a single reference to Jews and Moors, and this was merely to forbid them to pursue their industries publicly on Sundays and feast days, with a threat against the judges who, through bribery, permitted this desecration. It is fair to conclude that the law of 1412, if observed at all, was enforced only in scattered localities. That the restrictions on commercial activity were obsolete is manifest from a complaint in 1475 to the sovereigns from the Jews of Medina del Pomar, setting forth that they had been accustomed to purchase in Bilbao from foreign traders cloths and other merchandise which they carried through the kingdom for sale, until recently the port had restricted all dealings with foreigners to the resident Jews, whereupon Ferdinand and Isabella ordered these regulations rescinded unless the authorities could show good reasons within fifteen days. With the settlement of affairs under Ferdinand and Isabella, the position of the Jews grew distinctly worse. Although Don Abraham Sr., one of Isabella's most trusted counselors, was a Jew, her piety led her to revive and carry out the repressive policy of San Vicente Ferrer, and, in codifying the royal edicts in the Ordenanzas Reales, confirmed by the Cortes of Toledo in 1480, all the savage legislation of 1412 was reenacted, except that relating to mechanical trades, and the vigor of the government gave assurance that the laws would be enforced as we have seen in the matter of the separation of the Judarius. Ferdinand's assent to this shows that he adopted the policy, and in his own dominions, by an edict of March 6, 1482, he withdrew all licenses to Jews to lay aside the dangerous badge while traveling, and he further prohibited the issuing of such licenses under penalty of a thousand florins, Another edict of December 15, 1484, recites that at Celia, a village near Teruel, some Jews had recently taken temporary residence. As there is no Juderia, in order to avoid danger to souls, he orders them driven out, and that none be allowed to remain more than twenty-four hours, under pain of a hundred florins and a hundred lashes. This recrudescence of oppression probably had an influence on the people, for there came a revulsion of feeling adverse to the prescribed race, inflamed by the ceaseless labors of the frailes whose denunciatory eloquence knew no cessation. Under these circumstances, the Jews and Moors seem to have had recourse to the Roman Curia, always ready to speculate by selling privileges, whether it had power to grant them or not and then to withdraw them for a consideration. We shall have ample occasion to see hereafter prolonged transactions of the kind arising from the operation of the Inquisition. Those with the Jews at this time seem to have been closed by a motu proprio of May thirty first, 1484, doubtless procured from Sixtus the Fourth by pressure from the sovereigns, in which the Pope expresses his displeasure at learning that in Spain, especially in Andalusia, Christians, Moors, and Jews dwell together, 
that there is no distinction of vestments, that the Christians act as servants and nurses, the Moors and Jews as physicians, apothecaries, farmers of ecclesiastical revenues, etc., pretending that they hold papal privileges to that effect. Any such privileges he withdraws, and he orders all officials, secular and ecclesiastical, to enforce strictly the canonical decrees respecting the prescribed races. Under these impulses, the municipalities, which in 1462 had petitioned to have the prescriptive laws repealed, now enforced them with renewed vigor, and even exceeded them, as at Balmaceda, where the Jews were ordered to depart. They appealed to the throne, representing that they lived in daily fear for life and property, and begged the royal protection, which was duly granted. Subjected to these perpetual and harassing vicissitudes, the Jews had greatly declined both in numbers and wealth. An assessment of the poll tax, made in 1474, shows that, in the dominions of Castile, there were only about 12,000 families left, or from 50 to 60,000 souls, although there were still 216 separate aljamas. Their weakness and poverty are indicated by the fact that such communities as those of Seville, Toledo, Cordoba, Burgos, etc., paid much less than inconspicuous places prior to 1391. The aljama of Ciudad Real, which had paid in 1290, a tax of 26,486 maravedis had disappeared. The only one left in La Mancha was Almagro, assessed at 800 maravedis. The work of Martinez and San Vicente Ferrer was accomplishing itself. Popular adhorrence had grown, while the importance of the Jews as a source of public revenue had fatally diminished. The end was evidently approaching but a consideration of its horrors must be postponed while we glance at the condition of the renegades who had sought shelter from the storm by adopting the faith of the oppressor. The conversos, in steadily increasing numbers, had successfully worked out their destiny, accumulating honors, wealth, and popular hatred. In both Castile and Aragon, they filled lucrative and influential positions in the public service, and their preponderance in church and state was constantly becoming more marked. In Catalonia, however, they were regarded with contempt, and, though the boast that Catalan blood was never polluted by intermixture is exaggerated, it is not wholly without foundation. The same is true of Valencia, where intermarriage only occurred among the rural population. Throughout Spain, moreover, the farming of all the more important sources of revenue passed into their hands, and thus they inherited the odium as well as the profits of the Jews. The beginning of the end was seen at Toledo, where, in 1449, Álvaro de Luna made a demand on the city for a million maravedis for the defense of the frontier, and it was refused. He ordered the tax-gatherers to collect it. They were conversos, and when they made the attempt, the citizens arose and sacked and burnt not only their houses, but those of the conversos in general. The latter organized in self-defense, and endeavored to suppress the disturbance, but were defeated. When those who were wealthy were tortured, an immense booty was obtained. In vain, Juan II sought to punish the city. The triumphant citizens, with the magistrates at their head, organized a court in which the question was argued whether the conversos could hold any public office. In spite of the evident illegality of this and of active opposition led by the famous Lope de Barrientos, Bishop of Cuenca, it was decided against the conversos in a quasi-judicial sentence known as the Sentencia Estatuto, which in the bitterness of its language reveals the extreme tension existing between the old and new Christians. The conversos were stigmatized as more than suspect in the faith, and as in reality Jews. They were declared incapable of holding office and of bearing witness against old Christians, and those who held positions were ejected. The disturbances spread to Ciudad Real, where the principal offices were held by conversos. The order of Calatrava, which had long endeavored to get possession of the city, 
espoused the side of the old Christians. There was considerable fighting in the streets, and for five days the quarter occupied by the conversos was exposed to pillage. Thus the hatred which of old had been merely a matter of religion had become a matter of race. The one could be conjured away by baptism, the other was indelible, and the change was of the most serious import, exercising for centuries its sinister influence on the fate of the peninsula. End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Part 4